Hey guys, before we get started, I need to give a quick shout out to this video sponsor, MiHoYo and Honkai Impact 3rd. A cell shaded waifu stop mobile game that surprisingly is a lot more organic in its gameplay than I had originally expected. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of mobile games since a lot of them are more resource managing and puzzle solving, but Honkai's really impressed me so far with how active it is as a beat em up game, one of my favorite genres of all time. I mean, there's still RPG aspects to the game, such as leveling up and unlocking characters, weapons, skills, passives, and so on, but the bulk of the game puts its focus on action, which again, I don't usually see in mobile games. Movement with a virtual thumbstick is solid, and combat, though big and flashy, is controlled with just a few buttons that tie your combos and specials. But that doesn't make the game simple. Integrated concepts like type weaknesses and perfect dodges means you've got to be on top of your game. But if all this high-octane waifu smashing starts to get too exhausting, Honkai just dropped a brand new update giving your ladies fully customizable dorms to be adorable in. I mean it to. If you have any sort of weakness to chibis, this is going to make your heart melt. You start off with just a few characters splitting a bedroom, but as you get more materials, you can start expanding. And within each room, you also have all kinds of furniture that you can build in place. But the dorms aren't just for cute aesthetic, there's actual gameplay components to them. You can let your gals train their stats while you can harvest resources in the common area. So if you're down for some waifu crushing complimented by a sprinkle of chibi sleepy, check out my link in the description for more info on the game. Thanks for your support guys, and on to the episode! Hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here, and today I want to do something a little different. Most of the time on Culture Shock, we break down gaming's big hitters like God of War, Pokemon, Mario, and Zelda, and piece together the fascinating cultural and historic origins behind their character stories and locations. But today, I want to throw you guys a bit of a curveball and talk about one of my favorite rhythm games of all time, Taiko no Tatsujin, or Taiko Drum Master if you're not a colossal weeb like me. And yeah, I admit, one of the big reasons why I love this game so much comes from its Japanese aesthetic. Where most rhythm games like Project Diva, Musica, and Groove Coaster follow a hyper sci-fi anime theme, Taiko no Tatsujin is more, well, traditionally Japanese, with their sentient Taiko drum mascots and side characters ranging from festival food to demonic child kidnappers, and no, that's actually not a joke. But something that makes Taiko no Tatsujin really stand out as a game for me is the fact that, believe it or not, it actually teaches you some of the basic fundamentals of real-life Taiko. How do I know this? Well, long before I was a YouTuber, I've been a Taiko drummer. While I was living abroad, I found a great little group that took me in and showed me the ropes despite having limited communications ability in Japanese at the time, and after moving to Texas, I found another local group that's helping me keep my established skills sharp and teaching me all new ways to play. But let me elaborate a bit on what I mean. Taiko no Tatsujin is deceptively simple in that, unlike a lot of other rhythm games, there are only two inputs, Don and Ka. More specifically, Don is hitting the drum on its face to produce a deep, heavy sound, while Ka is hitting the rim of the drum to produce a higher pitch clack sound. Now I say deceptively because when it comes to the higher difficulty modes, yeah, it gets really insane. However, at its core, Taiko no Tatsujin is about two things, Don and Ka. Now then, if you can understand the concept of Don and Ka in game, well, my friend, you already know about 75% of what you need to play the instrument for real. Now, that seems self-evident, right? Like, of course that's all it is for real taiko. It's one drum. You either hit the face or the sides. Well, the thing to understand is that unlike most instruments, taiko isn't taught with sheet music. Not traditionally, anyway. In a weird sort of way, it's taught orally. When you learn a taiko song, you learn it by singing it in a process known as kuchi shoga. Wherein, before you start playing it on the drum, you learn and repeat the dons and kas verbally. And instead of different notes on a sheet, you have verbal variations of don and ka. For example, straight up don and ka by itself are quarter, half, and full notes played by hitting the surface or sides respectively. But for eighth and sixteenth notes, you say doko or kara. Then you have dokon, which puts an accent on the second beat, and dodon, which puts the accent on the first. See, it sounds complicated, but again, if you got a good handle on Taiko no Tatsujin, you already get this concept. I mean, even in the English versions of the game, you still see Don and Ka written in plain text which teaches you the traditional way. Even the characters themselves give you a lot of insight into real-world Taiko. For starters, the two flagship characters Don-chan and Katsu-chan already represent the core principles of Don and Ka, but there's others as well. The Bachio couple, the two little sticks that grade you at the end of a song, those are based off of bachi, the term for proper taiko drumsticks, which come in various sizes, shapes, weights, and woods depending on what kind of drum you're playing. Typically, shou daiko and shu daiko drums will play with larger, denser sticks, and shime daiko are played with smaller, lighter sticks. 
And what's a Shime Daiko, you might be asking? Well, again, if you're into Taiko no Tatsujin, you might already know. Donko, the token female of the group, is the sentient Shime Daiko to Donan Katsu's Chu Daiko. Being the stereotypical lady drum, I suppose it would make sense that the game would have the smaller of the drums be the fragile feminine character, despite her aggressive affection to Tonchan. But yeah, all in all, if you get Taiko no Tatsujin, you get Taiko in real life. Now, here's the thing. I could honestly just leave this video at that and punch out early for the day, but the big reason why I want to talk about Taiko no Tatsujin in the first place is because of the newest version that got released mid-July, Taiko no Tatsujin Switch version. And yeah, that's the actual name. While the main game is still more of the same drumming to Japan's Top 20, this version of the game has over a dozen different mini-games that... Well, have you ever played Rhythm Tengoku? Yeah, it's a lot like that, though instead of interviewing oily wrestlers, you're playing out some of Japan's most recognizable Matsuri festival activities, and that's what I really wanted to look into with this game. Because while some of these references seem pretty straightforward, a lot of these minigames are influenced from some of Japan's most traditional, if not crazy, Matsuri festivals I've ever seen. But let's start with something simple, the Donka Obon Dance minigame. A pretty simple challenge where you and three other players don in ka to the beat of a song while moving in a synchronized circle around the Kitsune Mask Kid playing on the stage high rise. Now if this is already starting to sound familiar, then good on you, you know your festivals. Obon is the name for the three-day festival where ancestral spirits return from the other world to hang out with their families, and this minigame comes 100% from the biggest event in the entire festival, the Bon Odori Dance, and boy I wish the real thing was this easy. See, the real Obondori isn't just one simple dance. After all, the whole purpose of the activity is to entertain the visiting family spirits. Instead, you gotta remember a good six to seven dances at the very least. And each different town and prefecture have their own particular dances, making things even more complicated. But true to Taiko Drum Master, the dance is performed in a synchronized circle around what's called the Yagura, basically like a bandstand for Taiko players. Or for one of the only foreigners in the town to go up and play for the first time in his life trying not to screw up in front of literally everyone. But despite how terrifying it might be to play the taiko on the Yagura or even just dance in the circle itself, everyone is kind and welcoming for anyone who wants to dance together. Even if they're a two left-footed dork like myself. Then there's the shrine battle minigame, and this one is wild. You and a partner bounce a portable shrine called a Mikoshi up and down to the rhythm of the music against another pair of players, and at certain points, the two teams will actually clash their shrines together and you gotta button mash as much as possible to push your opponent away. Now, here's the thing about Mikoshis. These are basically portable homes for Kami spirits to dwell in so they can be carried around and party with everyone else at the Matsuri. No joke. But these are still homes to the gods. Even though people have a tendency to climb on top of them during processions, they're still delicate, finely crafted shrines that need to be presentable enough for the kami. So it seems like slamming them together would be nothing short of disrespectful, right? Well, every October 14th in the town of Shirahama, that's exactly what happens. During the festival of Nara no Kenka Matsuri, three Mikoshi shrines come together atop a mountain in a massive arena, and as soon as the Mikoshi are hoisted up, the three clash together again and again until one of them is hoisted atop the other. It's actually pretty violent as there's no rules to the shrine sumo match. The only stipulation is that only men between the ages of about 16 to 45 are allowed to participate due to how chaotic it can get. But yeah, apparently even the kami got a throwdown once in a while. Speaking of competition, another minigame that actually comes from an all-important festival is the Long Rope Jump minigame of all things. See, just like our field day here in the US, Japanese schools from elementary to high school have taikusai, or sports festivals, where all the individual classes of kids compete in teams against each other in everything from relay races to three-legged races to, yes, even jumping rope. In fact, entire classes compete against each other to see who can collectively get the most rope jumps. Just like in Taiko Drum Master's minigame where everyone has to jump at the same time over the rope or lose points, entire classes of 20 or more kids have to jump a single rope together, and the class with the most consecutive jumps after about 10 minutes wins. Finally, there's one other minigame that comes straight from a well-known festival that I gotta talk about, the Mochi Pounding minigame. In it, you and a partner have to go back and forth in rhythm to the music bashing a barrel of mochi. The two big problems though is that the music constantly changes pace and onlookers get in the way of your visuals, so you have to rely on the rhythm of the pounding. But to be fair, the need to trust the rhythm and not your eyes is absolutely no different from the festival activity the game's inspired from. Mochizuki, the day-long festive practice of making New Year's mochi. You start off with soaked rice placed in an utsu, or ceremonial mortar, and then teams of two begin beating the mochi together with kine hammers in rhythm to start giving the mochi its shape. But after a while, it switches to one person hammering and one person turning the mochi, and it's at this point things can get insanely fast. <laughs> 
Just like it does in-game. Once the mochi reaches maximum thickness, it's either eaten in cake form as is, or sent off to confectionists to be made into the sweets we see in shops. Honestly, I could keep going with Taiko no Tachijin's relation to festivals. There's a ton of traditional stuff like the goldfish scooping minigame, the cooking minigame, and the fireworks minigame which all have their own origins and importance to festivals. And what's more is that a ton of these minigames expand way outside of festivals to even more traditional culture. Such as the red light green light minigame that's lifted straight from a Japanese variation of the game known as Daruma ga Koronda, or the Daruma knockdown minigame that's based solely on the traditional children's game of Daruma Otoshi. And lordy, I could probably do an entire video on the characters alone. But I wanted to focus on Taiko and festivals because you can't really have one without the other. And since Taiko playing in all these amazing festivals have been such a big part in my life, it's just something I really wanted to share with you guys. But thanks for watching everyone, and another big thank you to Miyoho for sponsoring this video. And if you guys would like to come by and see me live teaching culture while I over exasperately play video games for your viewing pleasure, Head on over to twitch.tv forward slash Gaijin Goomba every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 p.m. U.S. Central. But if you're hungry for even more culture and gaming, be sure to check out some of my other episodes, or my newer series, Witch Ninja, that delves into media's most popular shinobi to see which are good and which are bad. Well, historically speaking, of course. But either way, guys, until next time, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.